Rich <laughs> Ruwolf, Lancaster County music industry connector, club owner, band manager. You've done all kinds of stuff in your lifetime. It is true. And thank you. Thank you. I've, I've met, spent many a night in the old chameleon and some of the new chameleon too, but in the old chameleon, I spent many a night learning about uh, music I never would have seen otherwise. Um, Wolfman, uh, Walter Wolfman, Washington. I remember, I can't, can't remember all of the ones I've seen. So, so uh, how are you doing these days? I am doing well. Uh, of course, I'm busy working on our next festival, Lancaster Roots and Blues, which is in October. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. We started pushing ticket sales just a few weeks ago and people have responded. And, you know, I like to think it's because I put together a good schedule, but also I think people just have cabin fever. And they oh, of course. Because we can tell by the ticket sales, almost everybody is buying a three-day ticket. And that was not always the case in the earlier years. Mm -hmm. you know, you'd buy a day or a two, you know, a three, is a three is a real commitment. And people are like, we want to get out and they're buying the big ones. Yeah, yeah. well, good. good. <clears throat> yeah. So tell us a little bit about Lancaster Roots and Blues. Where did it start? And uh... Sure. Uh, the first year we did it was 2014, um, but there's a history to it. When I owned Chameleon Club, I opened it in 1985 when I was young, uh, 23, as I mentioned earlier to you. Uh, and, you know, I was, I was an odd young person. I had been turned on to blues when I was about 12 by my older brother, and I loved it. And, you know, it usually takes a while for people to develop a taste for the blues, but you mm -hmm. know, I young. So in my first year of business, I created the... Uh, uh, annual blues festival at chameleon club okay first, first year in 1986 it was always in february and it was always close to my birthday it was kind of my birthday present to myself the concept was that uh you know it, i didn't know if anybody would come but i'm like you know what i like it i'm just gonna book some good blues bands and we'll see who shows up and if mm -hmm. I, nobody shows up it's a birthday present to myself yeah but people responded immediately and uh you know, over time, it grew from one day to two days to three days, and it became consistently the biggest weekend of the year at Chameleon Club. Okay. And I, for the 17 years I ran the club, I did it every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, of course, I, we got married and we started having children. Uh, going to bed at four in the morning and getting up at six in the morning became incompatible lifestyles. Yeah. So, uh, we, uh, uh, well, so I got into other businesses. Mm hmm but then as time went on, I watched downtown Lancaster continue to bubble up and the wear center was built and the convention center was built. Teller 60 came on board, which was a local club. Uh, and it, it, it just seemed to me that the time was right to bring in- 2014. A festival, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a risk festival. There's a bunch of good stages close to each other. Mm -hmm. Of course, my, my club was still there at the time. And, uh, you know, you could wander from stage to stage and, and really enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you have a history, like in concerts, tell us about your, your, you were talking about your parents, actually the original, the original concert uh, sure. venue people were your parents. Yeah, it's funny. When I was a small child, like six, seven, eight years old, my parents had a club here in Lancaster called Hullabaloo. So it had to be people at least my age or older to remember that. I'm 59 now. Uh, and so, and it was a teen club. So what they didn't serve alcohol, but uh, they did live music. It was all live music. There was no DJs. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did, you know, all the good hot local bands at the time. Uh, and they did the occasional national artist. Um, but as a little kid, hold on, I'm going to see how I can turn down my volume. Can you still hear me? Uh-huh. Oh, I lost you. I got to keep the volume up. I'm getting messages. I'll turn them off. Anyway, um, as a as a little kid, I got to stand next to the stage, essentially backstage, and just see some great music mm -hmm. and, and see how shows get put on. Uh, but I got to tell you, from the age of eight till 22, it wasn't like I was going, oh, I can't wait to open my own club. I wasn't thinking about it at all. Yeah. Uh, but so you went, you know, what did you go to school for? Uh, I went to school for, uh, well, philosophy and business because, you know, okay. it was a nice mix. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and I didn't graduate, so there's no degree in this in this camp. Okay. Uh, 
I opened School of Hard Knocks. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I came back to, after I went away to school and I came back to Lancaster and uh, my girlfriend and I at the time, we we're just going out and we're realizing, wow, this town's kind of lame. There really wasn't much going on. Uh, so we'd have to go to Philadelphia or Baltimore to see something we really liked because we both like music. Um, and so I kept talking to her. I said, you know, someday I'm going to open a club. I just should open a club. And then she finally moved to Florida and she goes, well, if you ever get your act together, you let me know and I'll come back. And uh, a few months later, I just realized that there was this empty room behind a restaurant in town called Tom Payne, the restaurant mm -hmm. was Tom Payne's restaurant. And for those who don't know, that was a, it was probably the fine dining restaurant back in the day in downtown Lancaster. But the back room they used to do when it was first built back in the sixties, they would do like jazz bands and and it was a cool space mm -hmm. had, had a tent ceiling inside which actually gave it great acoustics but it was a cool vibe um but the room had run off run intermittently off and on and and the owner's children had tried their hand at doing some cool rock shows in there and they did but they weren't well they weren't didn't give it a real concerted day they in weren't day. consistent yeah so it was sitting there dark and i knew it was sitting there dark and so I just cold called the uh, the owner. I mean, I didn't have money, uh, not a lot of money. I, mean, I had saved from my job about twenty five hundred dollars, and my and when I got the idea. I called my brother, and and he invested twenty five hundred. So for the five grand, I convinced mm -hmm. this guy to let me rent his back room, which is kind of a convenient thing because I didn't have to buy a liquor license. Uh, you know, and technically back then, I'm probably even to this day, you're not supposed to rent a liquor license. So. You know, we called it a management contract to keep the LCB happy. Mm -hmm. the board. Um, and we got the doors open and I just had to give him, you know, so much money per month. But I had never booked a band and I had never worked in a bar or restaurant. Uh, I didn't know how to bartend. But my girlfriend, I did call her and she did come back from Florida. Really? At the time, she was George Thorogood's guitar girl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> used to walk out on stage and give him a guitar in the middle of the okay. yeah. Um, So she came back and we opened it together. And uh, it, it was, uh, you know, a truly a labor of love. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did not have deep pockets. And if I had done too many shows in a row that lost money, that would have been it. Like, like more than like two weeks. But so I, excuse my voice, it's cracking. I'm losing it. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, the, um, it was a lesson. It was an interesting thing. We made money the first day, the first week, the first month, the first year. And, uh, I can tell you now, now that I'm older and have done other businesses, that's rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, and then I think, well, every time you start a business, you start making money right away. And that yeah. is not true. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and yeah. It, it, you, so it's you, five. you, others realize what you, you realize it's like, I, I, uh, when I, when I think of you, I think of, um, well, I guess they had the village. Right. That was, that, was, that was the established club in town. Yeah. So, but um, mostly, mostly they didn't have anything, any concert venue that was a, was a go-to place for out of town people. I say out of town. I I'm from York. So I would, I would go to Lancaster. You're, you uh, to see, you know, shows at your, your, your establishment. Um, not so much the village. Cause that's like, a, that's. Well, look, I, you, would, I know you would get, I, you would get out of town acts yeah. and you would get um, national acts and, and you would sprinkle, not even sprinkle. You would have, you would have the local talent in with it. Right. Mingled. Yeah. And so that was, I mean, it was definitely a different way of operating for Lancaster and, and mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the village, I, I'm not knocking them. I, I love that family. They've been mm -hmm. there forever. Uh, I think it's the longest running nightclub in America. But the I think it's the 40s? Uh, maybe 50s, I think. Okay, because I, th I thought it almost predated rock and roll. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, it's had a pretty fascinating history, but I knew the two original owners. They've since passed, but really wonderful guys. And, um, you know, but so when I opened up, what they were doing was typically they would do a, a good cover slash party band uh -huh. could be rock, could be new wave. And they would do them for almost the whole week, like uh, Tuesday through Saturday yeah. night. Uh, 
once in a while they'd sneak a national artist in there uh into the schedule um yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't their meat and potatoes mm -hmm. they, and they almost never did opening bands uh which is how you break local bands because you, yeah. you you give them a shot to play mm -hmm. uh, so my goal was to do uh largely original bands mm -hmm. uh largely you know i mean and usually we have one or two, you know certainly one but two or three bands in a night usually an opener and a headliner uh and the idea being because you always need to keep feeding in new talent mm -hmm. some bands go up the food chain and they keep going and, and it's great for them that's a rare occasion where they actually grow outgrow your club mm -hmm. but you can't just rely on the same band coming back every month because it's a small market and yes people are, you know even if they love you they're gonna get tired of seeing the same band every week of course um <clears throat> so yeah i I, the amount of bands that we did, even in the early years, was was pretty staggering. And I didn't go into it thinking I'd be booking national artists. I just thought I'd be looking booking local and regional talent. Yeah. But then the agents found me, and the, and uh, and they would start feeding me artists. And some of the first bands I did was Greg Allman uh, from the Allman Brothers, of course, and Dick Betts from the Allman Brothers. It was uh, different agents, but uh, you know, once one played, the other one had to play. Yeah. Both great shows, uh -huh. uh, and then uh, and then I started you know bringing in the national blues artist James Cotton, like nine time Grammy nominee or uh -huh. winner. Uh, he was, you know, he was the first big blues artist we did. Yeah, and people responded; they loved it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I saw who did I? I it was a, it was a keyboard player for the Almond Brothers playing with Quentin Jones. Yeah, that was Johnny Neal. Yeah, uh, he was wonderful. Oh my God. He's originally from Delaware. Uh huh. Uh, he's a blind guitar, uh, keyboard player. Yep. Uh, and then he ended up with the Almond Brothers. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then Quentin and him do have a little side project they do once in a while. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's all eight best players. It's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Aronson, uh, the drummer. Yeah. The, uh, the yeah, drummer for the Hooters. Usikian. Is it David Usikian uh, from the Hooters? Yeah, right? yeah. I can't pronounce his last name. Uh, I think it's Usikian. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, um, so from, uh, at what point did you outgrow Tom Paints? Um, by, I mean, literally by the second or certainly the third, we were there for three years. By the second year, it was apparent that, you know, what am I going to do? Because we were packed Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. Uh, and I wanted to keep doing bigger shows. I was, I had gotten the bug and there was limitations. It was a tight space. I think the legal capacity was less than 150, but you know, in nightclub parlance, that's 250. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then we actually started getting neighbor complaints uh, cause it was up in the, the building was up against some apartment buildings and you know, these shows would go late at night and they were good loud rock bands, some of them anyway. And uh, you know, it, it's hard to, mask the base you know and the low end and 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 also just the crowd pouring out at you know one or two in the morning yes uh you know if you filled live, with alcohol <laughs> yeah yeah every, everybody wants to see you know that you were there so <laughs> um so i started looking uh for other options uh -huh. and, and uh the building where chameleon is well was until recently now on water street became available yeah and, and uh i actually now we had made money uh, and I also brought a few investors in to do the big, the big switch. Uh -huh. We had to buy the building and do a thorough renovation, plumbing, heating, electrical, new roof uh, mm -hmm. system, new stairwell, and of course, building the stage and bars and uh, dressing rooms and all that stuff. So it would, that was a huge investment and we quadrupled the size of our, uh, our square footage. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a, another big lesson in business. Just because you have something that works really great in a small place doesn't mean it's going to work really great in a big place. Yes. It took me a couple of years to get uh, get my feet back under me mm -hmm. uh, and and pay the bills. Mm -hmm. But uh, eventually it became profitable over there too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So who were some of the first bands that played in that? <laughs> so there was only two locations why you owned it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the... And it's really only been two locations. It was really the first three years on North Christian Street behind Tom Payne's restaurant, about a block north of the village. 
Okay. North Christian's a little alley. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, and then uh, the location that we we made Water Street the entrance. Uh, for those who don't know, that location used to be a social club when I bought it. It was the Fraternal Order of Eagles. And back in its day, it was quite, quite the establishment. Uh, they had like 3,500 members. You're talking back in the 1940s. And it was like a, kind of a blue collar social club. Uh, a lot of the people who lived up on uh, Cabbage Hill, mm -hmm. the history, because uh, you, you looked at the membership list, uh, you know, it certainly wasn't a Hamilton club or something like that. Um, but uh, towards the end, they, they forgot to get new members and they were down to about 35 members when they bought the building. Um, and uh, it needed a thorough renovation. It was, the roof was leaking. There was pigeons on the third floor. Mm -hmm. so they were they were ready to be renovated. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Um... So you were you were there um, at that location for how many years before? It, I was I, I ran it from two I'm sorry 1988 until 2002, and then I sold it uh, to uh, my sound man Adam Clark, who had been my sound man, uh, a, a Grammy award winning sound man at Community Club because mm -hmm. he ran the recording studio too, uh, and then. Uh, he, uh, his wife, uh, and then they brought in a partner, Jim. Um, oh, his wife's name is Gretchen. I apologize. So Adam and Gretchen Clark and uh, Jim Albright. Okay. Uh, and they combined and they ran it for uh, almost two years. Uh, but it, they had other ways to make money. And so it wasn't their sole focus. And they, I think they decided to step back and do the other things. Okay. Uh, then they sold it to uh, Nick Skiatis. Okay. And Nick's fam family uh, had the experience of running a bar in town and also doing live music. And that was, uh oh, now you gotta, do you remember that bar? Going way back, it was called the Lao Zeus. It was an old, used to be a distrib beer distributor behind it. Now I can't remember the name of the bar, and it's funny. Okay. Um, but anyway, so it wasn't like he they, he came in totally cold. He knew how to promote a show. Okay. And put on live music, and that was pivotal. Because uh, I would say if you had given me the big chameleon as a young man yeah. with no experience, it would have gone out of business quickly. Yeah. Because there's a learning curve to how to put on shows successfully and promote them successfully. Yes. And you wouldn't want to start at too big a level. It's nice to start small, which I got a chance to do. Yeah. Then, yeah. That's true with everybody. <clears throat> I, I always say too much too soon. Uh, that that can hurt people more than they know. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. So so you you state it's it's it's, it's known that many, many of the Lancaster and, and surrounding areas musicians got their start at the chameleon so who are some of the who, who are some of the acts that you saw grow up in your in your club sure well i mean going back to the original chameleon uh there was a band called the innocence mission okay you know more of a bits and mellow thing but they they ended up getting a record deal on a and m records mm -hmm. uh and yeah don and karen paris and yeah. mike bass mm -hmm. uh, and uh steve brown on drums um, and they had a, they had a good run though. It's interesting. I mean, they were never like a big arena rock band or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's more of a ambient or they're good true, probably true alternative before Nirvana. Yeah, interesting. But nobody would ever confuse those two. Uh, huh? Nobody would ever confuse those two. Oh, of course, were, yeah. yeah, they weren't yeah. punk rock. No, no, they were they were mellow uh, yeah. singer songwriter stuff. Of course, Cameron, the principal songwriter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they so that was they were the first. Um, another a young band called the Ocean Blue uh, got a record deal right out of Chameleon, out of the Water Street Chameleon. Okay. They were managed by uh, a guy named Peter Friedman, who was from Lancaster. And then I think he ran the concert committee at uh, University of Indiana, Pennsylvania. Okay. He was going to school there, and then he ended up working in the mailroom at ICM, uh, you know, one of the big agencies in New York. And then mm -hmm. he just 
himself up. And I believe he managed the Sharks. Uh, and then he called me because there's this band called the Ocean Blue. What do you think? And I'm like, yeah, I think I think they're really good. So he signed them. And then he helped get him a record deal. Well, he what he did, he had him do a showcase at Chameleon. He brought down six major label record uh, execs. And, you know, kids, there was a time when it was a big deal to be get a record deal. <laughs> yeah. Because you could make money back then. Yeah. Because uh, people used to buy your records. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so. Now, I don't know what it is now. It's right. still up. <laughs> But the biggest agency, uh, the biggest agent there was a guy named Seymour Stein, who's a, uh -huh. if you don't know who he is, you should Google him. Yep. Uh, you go, oh, that guy. Sire, Sire Records. Sire Records. He pretty much signed everybody. Mm -hmm. on the Blondie and. It, yeah, the Ramones maybe. Yep. Uh, did he have something to do with Bruce Springsteen? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen a list in a while, but it, it is, it's epic. Um, and he, he liked the band. And he went backstage and pushed his way through all the other record execs. And he offered him a deal right backstage. And literally, they, 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 I don't know if they inked the deal, but they made a handshake agreement back there. Okay. So they literally signed out of the club. And they had a nice little run. Uh, but that was definitely early alternative. They had kind of the English. Almost pop. new wave. Yeah new, yeah, new wave slash into. Yeah, I guess what did it. It was. They did have a review one time, and it's a fair review, but you know they had a record come out, and then they said it's Echo of the Bunny Men, <laughs> you know, because okay. it's similar to what was coming out of England. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, boy, I mean, it was a whole bunch of energy going on. Uh, a young band called Public Affection mm -hmm. uh, from York, which I believe yes. you're familiar with. I do. I remember them. Right out of high school, like. I remember them right out of high school. I am that old. <laughs> June of when they graduated. Uh, so 1989, maybe. They played a chameleon. And they might have opened for the Ocean Blue. Or maybe they did another show and then opened. But I know whatever show they did first, I liked them immediately. Uh -huh. Now, you got going back then, I created a thing called All Age Sundays because we didn't have a Sunday liquor license at first. It wasn't it was hard to get back in those days. And so we would do just basically young bands and young audiences, and we'd lock up the liquor and the beer. And uh, we would do typically three bands on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And they were almost all high school or college bands. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it was a real, it was a real breeding ground for new talent. Yeah. Uh, and the kids came and drove from all over, you know, all the high schools. Uh, and, and it was a big deal to be there. And I think we opened at like four or five o'clock in the afternoon and the shows were done by like seven 30 or eight. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was fun to watch like 15, 16 year olds sitting in the back of the club, like between sets and they're having these conversations about the artistic value of a given band show. Mm -hmm. And it was serious stuff. Like people were you know, and it didn't matter. Like I would really mix it up. There'd be some harder bands and there'd be some emo bands, you know, when emo wasn't even a name yet. Like you just, you know, kids would look at their shoes and be sad. Like, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, the, you know, uh, so the shoe gaze. Yeah. So you had to, you had to make sure. <laughs> they came up with a name for that. An alternative was just starting to become a thing. Uh, and then you know, had some classic rock sounding bands. I mean, it just didn't, every kid was doing something different. Every yeah. band. And uh, so then, so this young band, Public Affection, I loved them immediately. And I, a lot of the high school bands weren't that good. Uh, obviously, they're new. Yeah. And they're, they're not even masters of their instrument yet, mm -hmm. let alone, you know, know how to play with other people. Yeah. So a lot of times it was painful. But these guys immediately had a sound that was distinctive and it, I would typically on Sunday would you know work the ticket booth, get the crowds in, then I go up in my office and do paperwork or whatever, and not spend a whole lot of time in the room watching the bands. But I could hear through the walls, and I heard live or public affection, and I could tell right away that this was cool. It drew, it literally pulled me out of the office. I came down the balcony, I looked down, I watched them. And then I started giving them good shows because I'm like, these guys need to go. Mm -hmm. like, they're going to be huge. How long was it before they got signed? 
you know, it's the timeline's getting fuzzy in my head. Uh-huh. I think by, uh, I mean, the energy was there. So they certainly did an Ocean Blue show that summer. And then I had them open up for a band called the Pixies. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an important band. Yeah. Who, by the way, the late version of the Pixies, the bass player in that band, is from Lancaster. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, Who is that? Mark Eibold. Okay. He was also in another seminal punk band, and now I can't quite remember. Oh, I'm losing my mind. And people are watching, going, you idiot, it's so-and-so. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so by in the fall, I mean, it was obvious things were happening, but it really wasn't playing a chameleon that got on the record deal. Uh, Peter kept dragging them up to New York, the bank. It, it didn't hurt. In other words, yeah. they, were, they, were, they were finding their... Yeah, they were developing getting their legs going. Yes, confidence. Yeah, I mean, any live performance is live performance. I mean, if you read like Keith Richards' book and how many shows they did in their first three years in the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. they did like nine hundred shows. It's an insane amount of shows. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they were playing six, seven days a week. Yeah, uh, every little pub that would hire them, or that would even not hire, they would just show up and play. Um, the one thing you do when you play that often is you you dial in your chops. I mean, yeah, you know. That's your college. You learn how to perform. It is your college. Yeah. So the uh, difference between, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't hate my hometown, but we didn't have that. We didn't have that kind of support here. Most towns don't. Yeah. Like, so that is a typical. I, I have called you. I, I when we talked about connectors, it's like you're you were that supporter that somebody needed, and, and in this case, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how many people have careers because of your establishment and your generosity and support. Well, I mean, I was, yeah, it, it, when I, I could tell you when I first opened the club, I just liked music and I wanted to do something cool. Yeah. And I was young and I thought that would work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as I developed and as the, the Innocence Mission got a record deal and then the ocean blew and then I started to see the possibilities. I'm like, oh, this is a real thing. Like we can really facilitate bands and help them. And mm -hmm. so live, I, I really sunk my teeth into and giving them great shows. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't called live yet. If the, the people who don't know the history, they were public affection out of high school into the chameleon. And then at some point when they got their record deal, they thought this would be the time to change our name. And they did. And they became mm -hmm. and live. Mm -hmm. And I, they sold over 20 million records. So I would say they've done a few good things. Yes. Or a few things right. Yes. Uh, and, and I consider them all my friends and I'm very proud of them. And it's, it's exciting to see what they've done over, over the yeah. last 25 years. It's funny because uh, and I bring this up, not, not to, to diss them, but to show you about York, they played the battle of the bands that year. They graduated from high school and they lost to a cover band. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And that's Good God. That. You it's know, horrible. You could say well, you could blame the the town or the people in the town, but if they haven't been, I mean, not only did I nurture the artist, the band, yeah. I had to educate I had to educate the audience. Yes, kids start to look for. Um, I mean, it's think think when you're a kid, you like macaroni and cheese. Well, then over time, you learn to like you know nicer foods. It's just the same way with uh, with music. I mean, when I was 14, I went to see Kiss. You know, mm -hmm. and that was a big deal. Yeah. But like the other day on the radio, I heard Kiss on. I'm like, that's really bad. Yes. <laughs> I mean, they're not. That changed all my bad. life. Yeah, right? yeah. That band changed my life. Seriously, yes. Yeah. But yeah. like, you know, there's, there, so it's an evolution. And if there's no promoter or club or venue mm -hmm. that's giving band, original bands an opportunity to evolve and to, to grow and to play, then the audience isn't going to grow either. They're going yeah. to listen to cover music because it's on the radio and that's how they know. And, um, or, or, yeah, very simple stuff. Um, and so I would say that we did a service to the community and for a small rural, essentially a rural county, uh, I think we've got a pretty hip audience now here. Oh, yeah. Not everybody. So I was, okay, so part of my interest is musical scenes. And the education, without sounding snooty, I think education is a part of that. You yes. want to get a healthy music scene, 
you want people to stay in your community right uh or cut at least come back right um education of t being not only tolerant to original music but kind of like the foodie version wanting it yes you know yes, expecting it i had the level of expectations i had booked brantford marsalis uh he had his 13 piece band uh i was there buckshot lafonk i was there and that, i will tell you this Go that ahead. show i will tell you that is that show changed me and i'll tell you that later but anyway that's awesome so afterwards i hung out with brantford and we got a little drunk together and we talked for like an hour and a half and you know his father is a, was an edu was a musician and an educator and he he taught almost every great musician that ever came out of new orleans in the yeah. last 40 years 50 years uh and i mean new orleans just it's a scene that just feeds upon itself and feeds upon itself but you want to talk about a connector you know talk about the marcellus's dad yeah and, ellis uh, yeah yes uh who just yeah. passed away this past year from covid mm -hmm. um so you're right about the education it's critical right? yeah yeah so uh, branford branford okay so they had two fender roads dirty fender roads on either side of the stage foot facing each other they had an upright bass player who doubled on 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 a, a jazz bass these dissonant Miles Davis chords on either side of the stage. They had a funky drummer. And they had this guitar player that sounded like Tony Iommi. <laughs> I never did acid. <laughs> you didn't have to. <laughs> that completely changed me. <laughs> that completely changed me. Because it's like, oh my God, it's like they, all these things can go together. Yeah. 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 So um, he's fearless. Huh? He's fearless. Oh, he's, he, he, is my, he is my spirit animal. So I got to tell that you, band I'll, was. I'll give you uh, a, a, a rock and roll story with Branford Marsalis' band. Okay. They were a touring, they come from Philly, they played in Lancaster, and they were supposed to go to Pittsburgh. I put them up in a local hotel. I won't say the name. It doesn't matter. It's not there anymore. So it was the Brunswick. It's now been renovated. It's a nice new hotel. But back then it was a hotel on its last legs. And uh, these guys checked in and I was paying for the rooms. Uh, they were so uh, not impressed <laughs> that after the show, they got back in their bus. They drove back to Philly because it was the only place they could get like five-star hotel rooms somewhere. And they and they st they spent the night there on their own dime, and then had to drive to Pittsburgh the next day. So they basically added three hours to the trip so they could stay in a nice hotel. <laughs> yeah, but well, this was also Brantford at the time was playing for Jay Leno. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, maybe a year later, he plays a trio at Long's Park. I don't know if you remember that, but anyway. Well, Longs Park frequently followed whatever I broke in town. The Longs Park would book it a year or two later. Okay, later. now did that they exist before their concert series exist before you? Yeah, it started, I think, after we started. I mean, there's always been an amphitheater there, but there was the the, the regular music series was not a thing until after Kameen got this going. Okay, so they, you have to, yeah, it, obviously, I just you, you you make changes in the in their expectations that that that. That makes it ripe for that. So okay, so now Tommy Conwell. Oh, Tommy Conwell, right? Yeah, boy, he was pivotal. Um, I opened Chameleon, nineteen eighty-five, June of eighty-five. About a month in, we booked this uh, young trio, rock and roll trio, out of uh, the Philadelphia area, Delaware, Philadelphia area, called Tommy Conwell and the Young Rumblers, and it was kind of a rockabilly slash rock and roll mix um and man that ca i can tell you some of the best live shows i've ever seen in my life with that trio and uh i wasn't the only one who thought so he was blowing up everywhere uh and my crowds loved him and it was really fascinating because you get he was a good looking guy and the whole band was good looking and 
the front rows was just full of women who were just like drooling. And then, but like, so the women wanted him and then the men wanted to be like him. It was that kind of, he had that kind of cross appeal that everybody liked him. Uh, and he was a genuinely nice guy. He still is. Yeah. <laughs> was, But um, yeah, they, so we kind of grew up together that, that show sold out. I, I mixed him with his original blues band. He was with a band called Rocket 88 out of Delaware. Mm -hmm. I had alternating sets. I, 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 I subbed for that band once. Oh, really? With oh, good. Quentin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's yeah, Quentin's in it now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they were a Rocket 88, it's just a great pub band. And one of their final shows is going to be at the festival in, in October. So, uh, well, one of whose final shows? Rocket 88. Oh, gotcha. Uh, yeah, he, he's had some health issues and he unfortunately got hit by a car recently. But really? Like chasing a, an animal out of the street, like trying to save an animal, a dog, okay. I think. Um, or was a child. Anyway. <laughs> it was horrible. He was being a hero and uh, he got hit. So um, anyway, that show went, it, it got to like two o'clock, which was closing time but it was so much energy in the room and uh, and it was full and like nobody was leaving. And I said, hey, who wants to hear more? And of course the whole crowd goes, yeah. So I said, lock the doors and they jam for another hour and a half till 3.30 in the morning. Um, I can tell you now, since I don't have a liquor license that that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was that much fun that, yeah. I mean, just amazing. And that tradition continued for years and years. And then he grew, he grew into a five piece band. He got a record deal on Columbia records. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, the red hot chili peppers uh, got a deal. Yeah. And they, in fact, Rolling Stone did a 10 page article on both of those bands and said, these are the two hottest new bands coming up. And, you know, it was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so the, they had a couple albums out. I guess their, their, their song was, I'm not your man was one of them. That was one of their hits. Yeah. I would say Tommy's issue, the reason he didn't go further uh, is I would say his limitation was songwriting. Okay. It certainly wasn't performing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it is no shame in being the best bar band in America. And yeah. Not, they were right up there. Yeah. 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 yeah no, no, after after, after that, they had, he had the Little Kings. Yeah. Yeah. We played around with that for a while too. Yeah. But uh, that, to me, the original trio just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure as a front man guitar player, it was a ton of work trying to fill a space for three, with a three piece band for, you know, an hour and a half concert. But yeah, man, I mean, wow, they were amazing. For those, of, for those of us who don't remember or don't know who Tommy Conwell is, he's a force on his instrument. He's like, uh, he is somebody that would bring Sonny Rollins, Wes Montgomery, and Johnny Thunders together. <laughs> Yeah, all yeah. those, all those, uh, and all those blues in influences, and all this, whatever music he likes, he makes it a part of his mix. And I can tell you, some of his fans are people like Brian Setzer. Yes, Chrissy Hind likes him. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, oh, he's ex he's exceptional. He is yeah. like you want to talk about underrated. Yeah, and um, to be fair, I don't think his albums really ca captured that. No, no, yeah, and that's a problem with blues and blues based music bar band rock and roll it, it's just great live it's just so hard to make that pop on a record mm -hmm. um you know i do this, this these these blues festivals and i love them but they really are meant to be seen live uh you know all those bands make records and i almost never listen to blues records because they're not that interesting to me yeah but live i i am taken to another space yeah yeah yeah. So who do you have? Who do you have coming this this fall? We have the Lancaster Roots and the Blues. Oh, let's see. Let me let me bring up a list. <laughs> I mean, I should know it, but like like I say, we're already at over seventy bands, and uh, I heard it. I hear it's growing this year. It has grown. It is. It is in fact grown. We're gonna have once, as I mentioned, once I add in all the local bands to the schedule, which should be added in over the next week. Uh, don't contact me. I've already booked everybody I'm booking. All right. It, just, it takes time to build the, uh, the, the, 
I built a web page for every artist and I try and give due diligence. I try to give fair play. So if you're the youngest or the most unknown band on the bill, you get the same quality web page as yeah. the biggest band on the bill mm -hmm. because it's your opportunity to shine. Yeah. Uh, and, and we don't, do open, we don't do and open festival. Every show has a start time and a finish time. And there's, you don't go to that. I mean, you might go and see the band before the other band, but that's not, it's designed to keep you moving from one venue to the next. Yeah. So always some downtime. So the next band gets set up. Uh, you're not stuck there. And it's not like you were forced to watch an opening band you didn't want to see. So every band's a headliner for their time slot. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Who do we got coming? Good Lord. Uh, I'll give you a name that people watching would probably know G love uh, G love and the juice. Uh, which is his new band. It's an eight piece band. He's always been G love and special sauce trio trio. And I used to book them back at chameleon. They're out of the Philly area, but boy, they're, they're a national, you know, force, uh, great band. And the guys he's bringing, uh, which I can't name yet, but I know who they are. And uh, I mean, they're again, all a list players. It's going to be over the top. Uh, he did a new record. G love did a new record with Keb Mo, who used to play for me at chameleon mm -hmm. and, and Keb, knows how to put together stuff mm -hmm. uh so the record's Which good had the producer yeah I, I don't know if he's the official producer i think he was actually well they worked together on it yeah. so uh but kev knows also how to uh, to lead a big band and he taught g love about that uh and so you're that's gonna be amazing yeah if you like your rock guitar gods the the, the new god is eric gales uh just a funky black guy. He's, uh, we had him about four years ago, what, 2017. Mm -hmm. And he was just breaking out. And, and I have people who stopped me to this day and said it was the best show they've ever seen in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he's even better now. So that's exciting. Uh, classic old guy that we, you know, old guy, I, I call him old. Uh, I love you too, Billy. Uh, it's Billy Price and the Charm City Rhythm yeah. Band. Yeah, he was always Billy Price and the Keystone, Keystone Rhythm, Rhythm Band. Yeah. So that, he, that was that was kind of a, a village kind of band, right? No, nah, and they might have played there, but th they were better than that. Like they yeah. were, they were, they were just a straight up horn band, yeah. and they're amazing. Yeah, uh, Shamika Copeland, yes. uh, singer of Washington Post this year on the front page said she is John, the Johnny Copeland's daughter. Yes, Johnny Clyde Copeland, who played a chameleon, and was a wonderful performer who's since passed, but. Uh, yeah, the Washington Post this year said she is the queen of blues in the world right now, mm -hmm. uh, and and I believe because blues well, and rock. Like, her, yeah, she's her uh, her blues is a rocking kind of blues. Yep, yep, and she's very powerful. Like sometimes she'll just leave the microphone and walk out in the audience and sing without a mic, and everybody in a room of a thousand can hear her clearly. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, if you follow this stuff, Larkin Poe. Oh yeah. It, yeah, they're they're just two sisters, uh, great singer songwriters, bl blues, yep. and uh, it's you know one of the bigger artists on this bill. Uh, I try to do young, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is cracking, uh, young and old, uh, and this time some of my veterans, Elvin Bishop and Charlie Musselwhite. Okay, Charlie Musselwhite's a harp player. He's played with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, 22 time Grammy nominee. Uh, I, I might be getting my numbers. He might be 13 time Grammy nominee, 22 blue, 22 time blues award winner. Mm -hmm. uh, Alvin Bishop, boy, he goes way back. I mean, these guys are in their late 70s. Butterfield blues band. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, and he also had that pop single hit in the 70s. Four round of fell in love. Good memory. There you go. <laughs> yep. Uh, my old. Uh, friend joan osborne is coming uh-huh uh though interesting we'll see if that actually happens because she's supposed to come but uh, the new orleans jazz and heritage fest which is the, the one of the biggest festivals in america yeah rescheduled on the same weekend as us okay and the 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 guy who runs that festival loves joan yeah. and she's always played his private party until three in the morning every year Mm -hmm. and he wants her there and, and i know her agent's calling me trying to get out of this deal so we'll yeah. see if she you ever hear trigger hippie i am not sure i have okay that was uh, steve gorman from the black crows right drummer 
Okay. She was a part of that. Tom Bukovac. Yeah, she's always doing interesting projects. Yeah, I mean, no, that was that 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 you could check out on YouTube. That maybe somebody, I don't know who's with them anymore, but uh, you know, people who know Joan from her one hit, "What if God Was One of Us." Yeah, yeah. That unfortunately, like it was obviously a good hit, and yeah. that was written by the guys from the Hooter, uh, uh, Eric Eric uh, Lindbrook. Yeah, and you know, I'm glad they had a hit, and that's great, but it then her management tried to get her to be like this pop star and it was never Joan. It wasn't her personality and she resisted it. Yeah. And she's turned down a lot of financial opportunity to play great projects. And I have a lot of respect for her as a musician. Absolutely. Uh, I, and, what I particularly love about Joan is her, she puts out cover albums. Right. And, and when not, she puts out cover albums, they, they, she rearranges them. Yeah. No it's not I, a cover band. It's, it is, we're going to re reframe this song. If you were, it's always wonderful. If you were the original artist, you would be honored to have Joan yes. cover your stuff. Yeah. Yes. And she's a seven time Grammy nominee. I mean, she's the real deal. Uh, I mean, I'll just list off some of the North Mississippi All Stars, uh, Buckwheat Zydeco Jr., and the legendary Il Sant Partis band. That's it's Zydeco music. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's Louisiana swamp music. Mm -hmm. it, Great party music. His yeah. father, Buckwheat Zydeco, used to play a chameleon. He did one of his first shows in the Northeast in 1986. Mm -hmm. And people just went, it was snowing, it was February. Nobody knew who he was, but the people who came just couldn't believe how great he was. Mm -hmm. He came back every other year. But the Buckwheat, it's not, his name was real name was Stanley Doral, but his nickname was Buckwheat Zydeco. Mm -hmm. uh, he since passed, but when he played a chameleon, his son was 17 years old and he was playing what we call the, the washboard, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the French Creole word for that is frat, fratier or fratois. Okay. Pronounce it. But, uh, and he was excellent. But since his dad passed, he's taken over the duties as the, the accordion player, which is not an easy switch. I was going to say that. Um, but, you know, he's, he grew up with it, so he knows how to do it. Uh, so I'm sorry I got interrupted here again um, but anyway it, it's going to be exciting to have them back Walter Trout another guitar guy uh -huh. he's, there's a girl named Vela who I absolutely adore and she's like if and it's been said and I agree if Amy Winehouse and Janis Joplin had a daughter mm -hmm. uh, so, and to tell you how fast things can happen these days she did uh, a song on TikTok in November of this past year in the middle of the COVID thing. Mm -hmm. It got 2 million views in like a couple of days. She got a record deal immediately. And by February, they were producing high quality videos. And all her videos, as soon as she releases them, gets like 2 million views, 2 million. Yeah. So that, um, that's, that is kind of the in industry is changing. Yes. And it's not a, the, old, the old thing where the, you were talking about the record deal. That's no longer. It, right. There's got to I mean, there's got to be some other way of. Uh, yeah, I mean, though, if you can cross over into the pop realm, there's money to be made. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, I mean, even as uh, oh, now I forget her name. But you know, they they'll complain like, hey, I I had you know a hundred million downloads on Spotify and I got a check for thirty five dollars. You know, like <laughs> it's just crazy stuff yeah, yeah. Man, numbers. but uh the, the, people do buy they do Peter Frampton had, had something like that yeah yeah it's just where he had an unbelievable amount of like millions millions and millions and millions on on Spotify and, and you got a check for like seventeen hundred dollars yeah. <laughs> and well Taylor Swift actually was she kind of she stayed off Spotify for a long time yeah uh, and then they they gave her the best rate but she still gets chump change compared to what she makes touring and such. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I can go on and on. There's just that's, so many. That's, that's thank yeah. you, Rich. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, if anybody wants to know about the Lancaster roots and blues festival that is this fall, uh, you can check out the website, which is, uh, Lancaster. I guess you Google it, but Lancaster roots and blues.com. Is there anything else? Anything else? 
you have going on? Um, that is pretty much your 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 baby. Yeah, that's that's it. I mean, I have there's some interesting things that may be happening up the road in nearby towns, mm -hmm. but for the moment, my focus is the festival. Yes, and we won't talk about Funky Fontana this time. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yes, you were a ba you band manager. You had to yeah uh, uh, add was, that to your list. I was hired to be kind of a, a more of a tour manager than the actual head band manager. Okay. Tried to get them gigs and mm -hmm. that was that was a that was a cover band. It was a very specific project. Yes. And, yeah. Yep. So. All righty. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank, Rod. Thank you so much. And uh uh yes. So I will see see you and uh and thank you. Yeah. And I will be I will be visiting or I will be I will be at your show. I, I don't know about three days, but I will be uh, certainly uh <laughs> You know so many people, there's a chance you're going to end up playing, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, all righty. All right, take okay. care. Thanks so Thanks. much. Right. Bye. Bye.